Uh, but getting into Acts chapter 6, verse 1, I'm going off the notes here. Uh, Luke, who is the author of the book of Acts, tells us, he says, Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. Now, this complaint that arose on the part of the Hellenistic uh, Jews, um, these Hellenistic Jews would have been Greek-speaking Jews who would have been born and enculturated outside of Israel. If you know your Old Testament history, uh, you know that in 586 B.C., uh, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, after laying siege on Jerusalem, he eventually destroyed the city of Jerusalem. He broke down its wall, he burned the city to the ground. Jeremiah describes this, uh, uh, and uh, the book of Lamentations itself describes much of this uh, from the prophet's viewpoint. That Lamentations is, after all, a lament. And he describes what goes on. Uh, when, when he sees his people being taken away into captivity. But what that begins is it begins the time period prophetically known as the times of the Gentiles, in which Israel did not have a king upon the throne. Uh, and they were under Gentile rule, as it were, prophetically speaking. And uh, it also began this time period known as the dispersion, or the diaspora. And these Jews were, were scattered. They were scattered throughout the world. They were sent into different parts of the world. And so as they were scattered and living in different parts of the world, they then began to adopt the language and the culture of the, of the regions to which they were scattered. And this happens. You know, you, you move to a different country, you wind up adopting the language and the culture of that country. It just it happens over time. Uh, I was the pastor of an of a, uh, English speaking ministry in a Chinese church for about 25 months, and you could see the cultural differences there. Uh, Karen was there, her husband was the youth minister there for a number of years, and you could see the grandparents, the parents, and the children, and the cultural differences that existed uh, uh, from those who came over from mainland China, from those who were born here in the U.S., and the language differences and the cultural differences, and there was conflict that arose in the church uh, as a result. And and what we're seeing is some of the cultural differences that existed here within the church, within the early church. Now, these Hellenistic Jews would have been Jews that had basically been living outside of Israel. They would have spoken Greek. Um, they would have been reading a Greek translation of the Old Testament. Around 250 B.C., uh, there was a translation of the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek. It was called the Septuagint. The Septuagint, it was the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. I have a copy up here for anybody that would like to come see it afterwards. It's called the Septuagint, and what it is, is it's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Now, the native Hebrews, these would have been Jews that would have been born in, in Israel. Uh, they would have spoken Aramaic. Many of them would have been reading the Hebrew Old Testament. That's what this is right here. This is called the Biblia Hebraica Stugartensia. It is the Hebrew Old Testament. I have a copy up here for any of you that would like to come and look at it afterwards as well. And this is the Hebrew Old Testament. Uh, and so there would have been a difference even in the Old Testament translations or, or books that they would have been reading, either a translation or the Hebrew text itself. Uh, this is also referred to as the Tanakh. The Tanakh, which is a, a, another term that refers to the Torah, the Nevi'im and the Ketubim, or the Law and the Prophets and the Writings, as that term uh, means. But there would have been cultural differences. They would have dressed differently, having come from different regions of the world, because when people come from different regions of the world, they dress differently, don't they? They wear different types of clothing. Uh, they speak different languages. Uh, they eat different kinds of food, don't they? Um, and, and sometimes people can feel different around people that come from different cultures, don't they? They, they? they sometimes don't feel a connection or a bond. And so what we have here is we have people that are coming together in the church, but we have this cultural uh, problem that arises. And so what happens here is that uh, there was this complaint that arose on the part of the Hellenistic 
Jews, that is these Greek-speaking Jews, again, who were born and acculturated outside of Israel, and the, and the complaint arose against the native Hebrews, that is the Aramaic-speaking Jews who had been born and were acculturated in, in Israel, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. And so what we have here is a form of cultural discrimination, is what we have. Now, verse 2, it says, So the twelve, and this would be the twelve apostles, summoned the congregation of the disciples. And they said to them, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Now, the verb that appears here is the Greek verb diakoneo. Diakoneo. And, uh, and, and the verb simply means to serve. Uh, it's the word that we bring into the English for, for deacon. Uh, and it simply means to serve. And, um, and so they, they make the comment here. They say, so, so the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Now they were honest in their address. I mean, they addressed the problem. They saw it's a problem. And by the way, let, let me make a comment here real quick. And I'll address it a little, a little more detail later on. But this goes to show that regeneration among believers does not remove uh, the prejudices of the world. That, 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 that when you have people that are born again, regeneration does not automatically remove worldly prejudices. Because at the moment of salvation, when a person believes the gospel of Jesus Christ... When, when, it, when it comes to, to really understanding anything more than that, well, what does that person know about Christianity? Really, nothing. And, and really, to get into living the Christian life, you have to really get into the Word of God. It really takes uh, a, a time of investment, of study, and learning the Word of God to push out a lifetime of worldly and human viewpoint so that you can begin to orient to understand what the Word of God is so that you can then begin to live the will of God. But what you have here is a conflict that exists that, that basically comes from this human viewpoint thinking uh, from their pre-salvation life. Because you have this, this discrimination that's existing uh, in the church. And so it says in verse 2 that so the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said to them, it is not desirable for us to neglect the Word of God in order to serve tables. In verse 3 it says, therefore, the brethren, therefore, brethren, and catch this, he says, select from among you, that is, from the ranks of the church body, seven men, that is, from amongst themselves, they were to judge by, that these seven men were to be judged by the members of the church, uh, to be men of good reputation, full of the Spirit, that is, they were to be led by the Spirit, um, and of wisdom, and the word wisdom here is the Greek word Sophia. And this has the idea of men who were governed by biblical truth that is practically applied to life. Biblical truth that is practically applied to life. And, and I say that in, in both ways there because one can have a knowledge of God's truth and not apply it. One can have a knowledge of God's truth and not apply it. I, I, over the years, I, it, it has amazed me that I, that I can talk to people who are studied in the Word of God. And yet when it comes to living that truth, they don't. Now there's a number of reasons why people don't. I mean, it could be that they're uh, pursuing the flesh. It could be that they're that, that they're just emoting. It, it could be that they're that they're in a, the midst of a crisis and they're mentally they're just shutting down. I mean, there's a number of reasons why people don't apply the truth that they know. But but simply knowing God's word is no guarantee that you're going to apply it. I love the passage in in Matthew seven. Uh, I think it's verse twenty four where Jesus said, "The man who hears my words." and does them shall be compared to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And so wisdom there is hearing and doing. Right? It's not just the hearing. He says the man who hears my words and does them shall be compared to a wise man. But then he says, but the man who hears my words and does not do them shall be what? 
shall be like a fool. And so you can hear and not do. And so I think when, 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 the, disciples, when the apostles here are saying, therefore select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit, that is men who are led by the Spirit and not by the flesh, and of wisdom, that is men whose life it has, is outwardly observed as, as having biblical truth that is practically applied to life, whom we may put in charge of the task, of this task. And so what you have here is you have a collaboration between the members of the church and the apostles. Now to me, this is of great practical importance. Because the responsibility does not fall solely upon the leadership. Do you know what you have here? You have delegation. You have the leadership of the, of, of the church here, the apostles. Basically, when the problem is brought to them, what do they do? They put it back, don't they? They say, look, you select from among yourselves men that are full of the Spirit, that have wisdom, and bring them to us, okay? And then we will put them in charge of the task. But there is a collaboration between the church and the leadership. And I think that, that this, by way of, of practice, is significant. And by the way, one of the things that I pointed out before is that when you're going through the book of Acts, what you have here as a historical book is descriptive, not prescriptive. Remember, we've talked about that. What you have is descriptive, not prescriptive. What you have is Luke telling us what they did. He's not necessarily telling us what we should do. In other words, this is not a mandate saying the church has to do it this way. This is not an imperative saying the church has to set up a model to do it this way. This is simply telling us what they did. And it becomes a model that, that, as, that as, as the church... Uh, we can look at this and we can say, well, this is what they did. And this, by the way, also shows that they were flexible. It shows that as problems arose, there was a certain flexibility in the church, that there was an adaptability there, that they were willing to adapt to their situations. A lot of churches don't have that. A lot of churches fail to uh, have that adaptability to situations. Verse 4, and here they set their priority. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Now that's the priority. That is the priority. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. You see, they realized their roles and their responsibility. They realized their roles within the church and what their responsibilities were. Okay? By the way, I think it's interesting too here that even when they recognized the problem, they really didn't assign blame. They, they didn't get into any, any blaming or name calling or any of that sort of thing. They offered an immediate solution. And I think that there's a great deal of practical wisdom there as well. They didn't get in, into any blaming or name calling. They recognized the problem, but they immediately sought a solution to it. And we're going to see the wisdom of that here in just a minute. Verse 5, the statement found approval with the whole congregation. And they chose... And we're going to have a list of seven names here. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas. And by the way, Nicholas here uh, was a Gentile, and it tells us that, a proselyte from Antioch. Now what's interesting about this list of names is they're all Greek names. They're all Greek names. Now, I thought about that. I thought about that for a minute. And I thought about what is the practical wisdom of this selection of these seven men. Now, here you have these widows who feel that a personal injustice has been done to them. Because in the daily serving of these meals, they feel that they have been neglected. Now, anger comes from a perceived injustice, real or imagined. Anger is the response to a perceived injustice, and they feel that, that an injustice has been done to them. And in this situation, there's an outcry, there's an outcry, a complaint that arises over this injustice that happens to them, in the sense that, that 
uh, they feel that they have been neglected regarding the daily serving of the meals. And they feel that the injustice has been done to them by who? Who, who, who's, who, who do they feel is the guilty party? The native Hebrews, right? So in the selection of these seven, these seven are going to be responsible for what? What, what are they now going to do? They are now going to deliver the meals to these Hellenistic widows, these Greek-speaking widows. Right? So what in effect we have here is the formation of the first meals on wheels. <laughs> and these seven men have been selected to make, sure, to make sure that the meals are delivered to these widows on a daily basis. Now the fact that these seven men are selected from the ranks of the Hellenistic Jews and the fact that they all have Greek speaking names, do you think that that would make the Hellenistic widows feel more comfortable? The fact that somebody from their culture showed up? Do you, do you think so? I tend to think that there is some practical wisdom in the selection of these seven men that would have made these elderly widows feel comfortable in the men that were selected because of their cultural similarity, because of their names, because it would have made them feel comfortable on a very natural, practical level. And I think that there is some practical wisdom to be seen here in the selection of these men that I don't think should be overlooked from the text. Okay? Verse 6, and they brought before the apostles, and, and, and these they brought before the apostles, and after praying they laid hands on them, and the laying on of hands was a sign of identification a sign of identification and approval. 